Hi there, it's Miss DePoy, and today we're reading The Egypt Gang, and we're on chapter 19, Confession and Confusion. That night, while the Oracle of Toth in the land of Egypt struggled with the question, where is security? Toby Alivar struggled with his conscience. He thought and worried and thought, and at last he broke down and did something entirely against his principles. He called up a girl. When April answered, all he said was, Look, I gotta talk to you and Ross tomorrow early. Meet you out by the parallel bars first recess. Can't talk now, party line. He had it all worked out so it wouldn't look fishy. When recess started, he went whooping down the hall and down the stairs with the rest of the guys who were headed for the basketball court. But on the way down the stairs, he pretended to stumble and turn his ankle. He denied that he was badly hurt, but he managed to look bravely in pain as he stumbled over to sit out the recess on the bench near the parallel bars. The girls were in the midst of a jump rope fad, so the parallel bars were pretty much deserted. When April and Melanie wandered over and registered exas exaggerated surprise to find him there, he got right to the point. Look, he said, I was the one who wrote those answers. I was the oracle, but I don't know where Marshall's old octopus is. What are we going to do? Of course, April and Melanie had a lot to say. They made Toby explain how he'd managed to steal a peek at the questions while he was conducting the ceremonies, while everybody was bowing. And then how do you look up the main words in it and then how he'd look up the main words in a big book of his dad's called Somebody's Famous Quotations. Then when he'd picked out a nice mysterious quotation, he'd sneak back to Egypt at night with the flashlight and written it on the back of the paper. But how'd you get out of the house like that, late at night and in the rain and everything? Did your dad know? Did my dad know? Toby said. Girls could ask the dumbest questions at times. Fat chance. He never bothers me in the evenings. He's usually working late in the studio or off at an art show sometimes. It was a cinch. Weren't you scared? Melanie asked. Going down there all by yourself alone in the dark? Well, Toby admitted, I wasn't exactly whistling Yankee Doodle, if you know what I mean. Did you happen to notice that the Oracle's handwriting was a little bit shaky? Well, I didn't just do that to disguise my writing. As a matter of, as a matter of fact, I was about to quit the Oracle business even before the rest of you decided to yesterday. That last night when I went down there, there was somebody in the alley when I was going home. The girls gasped. Honestly? In the rain and everything? Are you sure? As sure as I'd want to be. In fact, for a couple of seconds, he was just a few steps behind me. It was too dark to see his face, but he was there all right. Oh, what did you do? How'd you get away? How'd I get away? Look, Melanie, you ought to know how I got away. Who's been the fastest runner in our class ever since second grade? You, Melanie agreed, right. And when I saw someone behind me, I really cut out. I mean, jet propelled or something. Toby could always manage to be funny, even about something that really was pretty scary. But after a while, Melanie quit laughing and said, but who do you think it was? What if it was the man who, the murderer you mean? Toby interrupted, yeah, I thought of that all right. Did I ever? But after I got home and calmed down, I decided it was probably just some guy taking a shortcut home through the alley. I'm not sure he tried to catch me. I didn't wait around to find out. The girls laughed some more, but then April sobered up enough to mention that Toby's crimes weren't going entirely unnoticed, fooling everybody in line about the oracle. Lie to you, Toby said. I did not. I didn't lie once. I just gave the wrong impression. There's a difference. Besides, I should think you'd be grateful to me for going to all that trouble just to keep things livened up. My dad says that livening things up is my most outstanding talent. But what I think is, somebody has to do it, or else everything would just lie there and turn to dust. Okay, Melanie said, so you really livened up the oracle. You livened it up so much that Marshall thinks it's going to tell him where security is. What are you going to do about that? What am I going to do about that? Toby said indignantly. That's what I got you out here to ask you. What are we going to do about Marshall? Well, April and Melanie said to each other, only just with a look, not out loud, wasn't that like a boy? They got things into a mess and then they expected a girl to get them out of it. But since Toby was admitting he needed their help, they were willing to give it. And it didn't take them long to decide on a plan. April would conduct the ceremony that afternoon and she would pretend to read something off the back of the paper. It would say that security had gone on a long trip to visit his relatives in Los Angeles and then he would be home in a few days. Marshall wouldn't be completely happy about it, but at least it would give them a little more time to look for security or to think of something else. 
Then, Melanie explained, if we never can find him, at least Marshall will have a few days to get used to the idea, a little at a time. When you lose something like security, it helps if you can do it sort of gradually, and Toby and April agreed that that was probably true. Marshall was eager and happy when they picked him up at nursery school. Apparently, he was absolutely positive that the Oracle was going to find his octopus for him. In Egypt, April got ready to be the high priestess again because she had practiced just what she was going to say. Fortunately, there wasn't much chance of an argument. When it came to conducting ceremonies, Ken and Elizabeth were definitely the spectator type. Everything was going smoothly until April took down the question and with a dramatic flourish got ready to pretend to read. But then, instead of starting in on her speech about Los Angeles, she let her mouth drop open and nothing came out except a strange gulping sound. Toby bounded into the temple and snatched the paper from her hand. Then he looked at April in a strange way and they both walked over to where the rest of the Egyptians were waiting. On the back of the paper, in a fine, pointy, old-fashioned looking handwriting, it said, Look under the throne of Set. Toby read it out loud very slowly and hesitantly, as if he didn't really believe what he was saying. And while everyone else was still standing as if paralyzed, Marshall went into the temple and lifted up the piece of old bedspread that covered the egg crate altar of Set. He reached inside, felt around for a minute, and then his face lit up with a smile so starry that for just a second the other, wiser Egyptians felt just as pleased with their oracle as he did. But after that, they went right back to being incredulous. April and Melanie looked hard at Toby, but he shook his head so hard his shaggy hair stood out like an umbrella. No, sir, he said wildly. I didn't. I did not. I absolutely did not do it. The girls looked at each other and nodded in agreement that Toby was telling the truth. Nobody, not even Toby, was that good an actor. Toby didn't do it, Marshall said, hugging a slightly damp octopus to his chest. Set did it. Set did what? April asked, staring at Marshall in consternation. Set took security. I left him right there on the ground like I thought, and in the nighttime, Set took him. Sheesh, Ken moaned all of a sudden, clapping his fist violently to his forehead. I knew it. I knew all you guys were going to crack up someday if you didn't quit fooling around with this hocus-pocus stuff. Nobody's cracking up, Toby said thoughtfully, but something pretty fishy is going on around here. You're telling me, Ken said, and if somebody doesn't start telling me what it is, I'm going to walk right out of here and resign from the whole Egyptian race. I guess we better, huh, Toby said to April and Melanie. I mean, tell everybody all about everything. The girls nodded. So they went ahead and told the other three all about what Toby had done and what Toby hadn't done. And when they were through, they all stood and looked at the temple that they had made themselves out of ordinary stuff and their own imaginations and felt, well, maybe a little like Dr. Frankenstein had when he created the monster. They just stood there looking for a while and wondering. And then they all went home. And that's the end of today's chapter.